Mr. Zuckerman will give you more money when you get there. And it is my earnest wish that you use it to further your researches in culinary and vegetarian matters. And that you continue to work upon that great book of yours until you are satisfied that it is complete in every way. Your loving aunt, Gloss Penny. Lexington, who had always done everything his aunt told him, pocketed the money, put on a pair of shoes and a clean shirt, and went down the mountain to the village where the doctor lived. Old Glosspan, the doctor said. My God, is she dead? Certainly she's dead, the youth answered. If you'll come back home with me now, I'll dig her up and you can see her for yourself. How deep did you bury her? The doctor asked. Six or seven feet down, I should think. And how long ago? Oh, about eight hours. Then she's dead, the doctor announced. Here's your certificate. Seven. Our hero now sets out for the city of New York to find Mr. Samuel Zuckerman. He traveled on foot and he sleeps under the hedges. And he lived on berries and wild herbs. And it took him 16 days to reach the metropolis. What a magnificent place this is, he cried as he stood in the corner of 57th Street and 5th Avenue, staring around him. There are no cows or chickens anywhere, and none of the women look looks in the least like Aunt Gloss Man. As for Mr. Samuel Zuckerman, he looked nothing like that Lexington had ever seen before. He was a small, spongy man with livid jowls and a huge magenta nose. And when he smiled, bits of gold flashed at you marvelously from all lots of different places inside his mouth. In his luxurious office, he shook Lexington warmly by the hand and congratulated him on his aunt's death. I suppose you knew that your dearly beloved guardian was a woman of considerable wealth, he said. You mean the cows and chickens? I mean half a million bucks, Mr. Zuckerman said. How much? Half a million dollars, boy, my boy. And she's left it all to you. Mr. Zuckerman leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands over a spongy paunch. At the same time, he began secretly working his right forefinger in through his waistcoat and under his shirt so as to scratch the skin around the circumference of his navel. A favorite exercise of his and one that gave him a peculiar pleasure. Of course, I shall have to deduct 50% for my services, he said. But that still leaves you with 250 grand. I am rich, Lexington cried. This is wonderful. How soon can I have the money? Well, Mr. Zuckerman said, luckily for you, I happen to be on rather cordial terms with the tax authorities around here. And I'm confident that I should be able to persuade you them to waive all death duties and back taxes. How kind you are murmured Lexington. I should naturally have to give somebody a small honorarium. Whatever you say, Mr. Zuckerman. I think a hundred thousand would be sufficient. Good gracious, isn't that rather excessive? Never under tip. That's in tax inspector or policeman, Mr. Zuckerman said. Remember that. But how much does it leave for me? The youth asked meekly. Mm, 150000 But you've got the funeral expenses to pay out of that. Funeral expenses? You've got to pay for the funeral parlor. Are you sure you know that? But I bury her myself, Mr. Zuckerman, behind the cow shed. I don't doubt it, Mr. the lawyer said. So what? I never used the funeral parlor. Listen, Mr. Zuckerman said patiently, you may not know that but there is a law in the state which says that no beneficiary under a will may receive a single penny of his inheritance until the, the funeral parlor has been paid in full. You mean that's a law? 
Certainly it's a law. It's a very good one. It is too. The funeral parlor is one of our great national institutions. It must be protected at all costs. Mr. Zuckerman himself, together with a group of public-spirited lawyers, controlled a corporation that owned a chain of nine lavish funeral parlors in the city, not to mention a casket factory in Brooklyn, and a postgraduate school for embalmers in Washington Heights. The celebration of death was therefore a deeply religious affair in Mr. Zuckerman's eyes. In fact, the whole business has affected him profoundly, almost as profoundly, one might say, as the birth of Christ affected the shopkeeper. You had no right to go out and bury your aunt like that, he said. None at all. I'm very sorry, Mr. Zuckerman. Why, it's downright subversive. I'll do whatever you say, Mr. Zuckerman. All I want to know is how much I'm going to get in the end when everything's paid. There was a pause. Mr. Zuckerman sighed and frowned and continued secretly to run the tip of his finger around the rim of his navel. Shall we say, uh, 15,000, he suggested, flashing a big gold smile. That's a nice round figure. Can I take it with me this afternoon? I don't see why not. So Mr. Zuckerman summoned his chief cashier and told him to give Lexington $15,000 out of the petty cash and to obtain a receipt. The youth, who by this time was delighted to be getting anything at all, accepted the money gratefully and stowed it away in his knapsack. Then he shook Mr. Zuckerman warmly by the hand, thanked him for all of his help, and went out of the office. The whole world is before me, our hero cried as he emerged from the street. I now have $15,000 to see me through until my book is published, and after that, of course, I shall have a great deal more. He stood on the pavement, wondering which way to go. He turned left and began strolling slowly down the street, staring at the sights of the city. What a revolting smell, he said, sniffing the air. I can't stand this. His delicate olfactory nerves, tuned to receive only the most delicious kitchen aromas, were being tortured by the stench of the diesel oil fumes pouring out of the backs of buses. I must get out of this place before my nose is ruined altogether, he said. But first... I simply got to have something to eat. I'm starving. The poor boy had nothing but berries and wild herbs for the past two weeks, but now his stomach was yearning for solid food. It's like a nice hominy cut cutlet, he told himself, or maybe a few juicy salsa fritters. He crossed the street and entered a small restaurant. The place was hot inside and dark and silent. There was a strong smell of cooking fat and cabbage water. The only other customer was a man with a brown hat on his head, crouching intently over his food, who did not look up as Lexington came in. Our hero seated himself at a corner table and hung his knapsack on the back of his chair. Then he told himself, as this, he told himself, is going to be most interesting. In all my 17 years, I've tasted only the cooking of two people, Anne Glosspan and myself. Unless one counts Nurse McPottle, who must have heated my bottle a few times when I was an infant. But I am now about to sample the art of a new chef altogether, and perhaps if I am lucky, I might pick up a couple of the useful ideas for my book. A waiter approached out of the shadows of the back and stood beside the table. How do you do? Lexington said. I should like a large hominy cutlet, please. Two with 25 seconds on each side, and a very hot skillet with sour cream and sprinkle a pinch of lovage on it before serving. Unless, of course, your chef knows a more original method, in which case I should be delighted to try it. The waiter laid his head over to one side and looked carefully at his customer. You want the roast pork and cabbage? He asked. That's all we got left. Roast what and cabbage? The waiter took a soiled handkerchief from his trouser pocket and shook it open with a violent flourish as though he were cracking a whip. He then blew his nose loud and wet. You want it or don't you, he said, wiping his knuckles. I haven't the foggiest idea what it is, Lexington replied. But I should love to try it. You see, I'm writing a cooking book and one pork and cabbage. 
The ship waiter shouted somewhere in the back of the restaurant. Far away in the darkness, a voice answered him. The waiter disappeared. Lexington reached to his knapsack for his personal knife and fork. These were a present from Aunt Vossipan, given him when he was six years old, made of solid silver. He had never eaten with any other instrument since. While waiting for the food to arrive, he polished them lovingly with a piece of soft muslin. Soon the waiter returned, carrying a plate on which there lay a thick grayish white slab of something hot. Lexington leaned forward anxiously to smell it as it was put down before him. His noses were wide open to perceive the scent, quivering and sniffing. Oh, but this is absolute heaven, he, cried, he exclaimed. What an aroma! It's tremendous! The waiter stepped back a pace, watching his customer carefully. Never in my life have I smelled anything as rich and wonderful as this, our hero cried, seizing his knife and fork. What on earth is it made of? The man in the brown hat looked around and stared. Then returned to his eating. The waiter was backing away toward the kitchen. Lexington cut off a piece of the meat, impaled it on his silver fork, and carried it up to his nose so as to smell it again. Then he popped it into his mouth and began to chew it slowly, his eyes half closed, his body tense. This is fantastic, he cried. It's a brand new flavor. Oh, Glossman, my beloved aunt, how I wish you were here with me now so we could taste this remarkable dish. Waiter, come here at once. I want you. The astonished waiter was now watching from the other end of the room, and he seemed reluctant to move any farther, closer. If you come and talk to me, I will give you a present, Weston said, waving a hundred dollar bill. Please come over here and talk to me. The waiter sidled cautiously back to the table, snatched away the money, held it off to his face, peering at all from all angles, and he slipped it quick, quickly into his pocket. What can I do for you, my friend? He asked. He asked. Look, Lexington said, if you will tell me with what this delicious dish is made of and exactly how it's prepared, I will give you another hundred. I already told you, the man said. It's pork. And what exactly is pork? You've never had roast pork before? The waiter asked Aaron. For heaven's sake, man, tell me what it is and stop keeping me in suspense like this. It's pig, the waiter said. He just bung it in the oven. Pig? All pork is pig, didn't you know that? You mean? This is pig's meat. I guarantee it. But, but... That's impossible, the you stammered. Aunt Glosspan, who knew more about food than anyone else in the world, said that meat of any kind was disgusting, revolting, horrible, foul, nauseating, and beastly. And yet this piece that I've had here on my plate is without doubt the most delicious thing I've ever tasted. Now how on earth do you explain that? Aunt Glosspan certainly would have told me if it wasn't, it was revolting if it wasn't. Maybe your aunt didn't know how to cook it, the waiter said. Is that possible? You're damn right it is, especially with pork. The pork has to be very well done or you can't eat it. Eureka! Lexington cried. I bet that's exactly what happened. She did it all wrong. He handed the man another hundred bill. Lead me to the kitchen, he said, and introduce me to the genius who prepared this meat. Lexington was at once taken to the kitchen, and there he met the cook, who was an elderly man with a rash on one side of his neck. This will cost you another hundred, the waiter said. Lexington was only too glad to oblige, but this time gave the money to the cook. Now listen to me, he said. I have to admit this that I am really rather confused by what the waiter has just been telling me. Are you quite sure that this delectable dish, which I've just been eating, was prepared from pig's flesh? The cook raised his right hand and began scratching the rash on his neck. Well, he said, looking at the waiter and giving him a sly wink. All I can tell you is that I think it was pig's meat. You mean you're not sure? One can never be sure. Then what else could it have been? Well, speaking very slowly, still staring at the waiter, there's just a chance, you see, that it might have been a piece of human stuff. 
You mean a man? Yes. Good heavens. Or a woman. It could have been either. They both taste the same. <laughs>